at this session on uh, integrating e-government uh, with Inspire. I am Adam Daniel Nagy from uh, DG Environment, European Commission. Um, I am in charge of, uh, uh, along with the team, on uh, Inspire implementation. <coughs> the way of introduction, uh, just to highlight how Inspire and e-government uh, is actually uh, linked, linked up at a political level. As you know, last year, the Digital Single Market Strategy was uh, established by the uh, European Commission. A communication and the staff working document was, uh, was published, um, and we have some important hooks on, on Inspire in relation to interoperability, uh, framework e-government, and uh, as a consequence, this year, uh, an e-government action plan was uh, 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 published, I think it was in uh, either in March or April, where one of the action points is actually the, the uh, deployment of uh, and uh, the, the um, enhancement of uh, Inspire implementation. So uh, there we have an important hook. Um, we actually, uh, uh, from the outset, it wasn't uh, actually so, so simple to, uh, to extend the digital uh, single market strategy over uh, the concept of e-commerce and actually sale of goods uh, and purchase and sale of goods on the internet, but uh, we managed to succeed actually. Uh, and uh, we even have a reference to um, Michael Lutz's um, article on interoperability in the staff working document. So uh, that's, a, that's a huge achievement. So um, with that in mind, um, I would like to invite our sp uh, first speaker from Spain. The floor is yours. Uh, hello, good morning. I, I am not Amalia Velasco. My name is Fernando Serrano, and um, I work in uh, cartography in the General Directorate of the Cadastre of Spain. Uh, this is the summary of my speech. Cadastre and property rights registry are uh, different institutions in Spain. Uh, for a century, they are trying to coordinate with some results. The parcel identification in deeds and titles by its cadastral reference or code is put from 1996. But a legal reform in uh, 2015 aims to adjust the description of the register and the cadastral cartography using Inspire GML of cadastral parcel and automated uh, exchange. Uh, the coordination procedure is a case of success in our country, and my point of view is the geographical information, the GML, more than the coordination process. Uh, how are uh, the cadaster and the register? The cadaster is an administrative register and uh, uh, has a deep influence in the government citizen relationships. Uh, the inscription in the cadaster is mandatory. Uh, it's a fiscal cadaster. Uh, we value the real estate for tax purpose. Uh, we have a continuous and homogeneous GIS for the complete territory. Um, we uh, provide open access and free of charge, but uh, also we uh, have protection of uh, private data. In the other hand, the property right register is a juridical register uh, with legal effects in on private information or on private relationships. It's a register of rights uh, even of mortgage. Uh, registration is not necessary to have a contractual entitlement, but is needed to have rights protected against everybody. To en ensure legal safety of property rights, and the, the finances is uh, registration fees by uh, protected owners and by sure registry publicity. I am not to give more details of both organizations. Uh, I put the, the, the point in the cartography and the coordination. Uh, cadastral maps are homogeneous and continuous. 
In Spain, there are not licenses to rails. In Spain, it's not obligatory to mark the parcel boundaries in the land. Uh, buyer and seller uh, make an agreement or uh, neighbors make an agreement about the boundaries. Uh, so, before 2015, register had in some cases cartography, but it was not official and it did not have legal effects and protection. From 20, uh, 2015, the description of properties in the property right registry may include a georeference graphical representation based on the cadastral cartography. Uh, in this point, when a parcel has the uh, geographical representation in the register, the limitation, location, and area have the same protection that the owner title or uh, uh, other rights. So it's the register who has to qualify if the, the real estate and the cadastral parcel are coordinated or not. Uh, how cadastral cartography is supplied? Uh, Cadaster is the legal mandatory organization for cadastral parcel in, in, Spain, in Spain and is providing inspired services for cadastral parcel and other inspired themes. Cadaster has a website as a point of access to electronic services where users can download cadastral data, including inspired GML and cadastral certification in PDF. In some cases, the cadastral cartography is not updated and citizens or register have more recent information. Then, registers can use alternative georeference representation. This uh, alternative representation is used to update cadaster, but it must pass a technical validation provided by cadaster as a service, a alternative graphical validation. This is our web page with all the inspired services uh, of cadastral cartography. And um, you have here uh, the, the, the address, the, oh, the address, okay. Um, we have information about uh, license of access and use. We have meta data about the different data sets, cadastral parcels, addresses, and buildings. Uh, we have visualization services, uh, like this web map service. We have download services. Uh, for, for example, the web theatre service that is based is equal of the GML uh, file and um, a data set in Atom files. And uh, all this information is related in each complaints, uh, the specifications of Inspires, of uh, European loc Locator uh, fr Framework, and the Spanish uh, geographical infrastructure. Uh, I am not going to explain how um, we make a GML uh, uh, file because it's, uh, we, we follow the uh, data specifications of the, of the firm uh, in Inspire. But uh, how to make the information available? Uh, the GML Inspire file uh, of cadastral parcel can be obtained at the electronic office of the cadastre as a service uh, using the web theatre services inspired cadastral parcel or through free access from the screen query results. Uh, and this is the most common and, and the most easy way as a attached file in a cadastral certification. This is a, how it looks a cadastral certification. Uh, the certification have cadastral reference real estate data, uh, omnesphere data, other data, for example, a condominium or something like that, uh, graphical information, uh, who is the applicant and who is the purpose of this certification, if the parcel is coordinated or not with the real estate in the register, and the attachment. The attachment are two. The GML uh, cadastral parcel inspired file, 
and a list of uh, coordinates in uh, PDF. Uh, more details. Uh, the cadastral certification is used by citizens to describe the parcel in notaries and register. The PDF file uh, is signed electronically using a secure uh, verification code, CSV, uh, that you can see in the right uh, side of, of the certification. This code makes possible to obtain the file and verify its origin and validity in the electronic office of the cadaster. Uh, applications of notaries and registers use a web services to access the content of the GML attached file using this CSV code. What about the alternative graphical representation? Uh, is needed when cadastral description is not correct. The reality is different than the cadastral parcel. Or when cadastral information is not uh, updated. Or there are or there will be changes in the territory. New parcels, segregations, group of plots, public works, uh, parcelling, land consolidation, uh, consolidation uh, urban planning, etc. Or a surveyor supplies us with a more accurate parcel map. Uh, as the G GML changed the parcel and the cadastral mapping, it is necessary to assure changes will fit in the cadastral map because the cadastral map is a continuous map uh, and we, we must fit in it. Alternative graphic validation service is a technical and cartographic check prior to processing this information information to the notary or register. This is uh, the uh, main uh, screen of the uh, process of uh, uh, graphical validation. The first step is to user ID by electronic signature, citizen or technician. Uh, if uh, the user is a surveyor, architect, engineer, a form appears where the technician must put the characteristics and specification or his job. Uh, the second step is to insert the cadastral reference of, of the parcels. Uh, the third step is to upload the GML files. Uh, users can put other layers uh, as cadastral cartography or orthophotos to see how fit it with, uh, with the, 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 these layers. layers. So, uh, the fourth uh, step is the check itself. Uh, the analysis is by geometrical overlapping uh, between GML and uh, current cadastral uh, mapping. Um, there are some code about uh, the, the surface. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the step number five is the report uh, itself. Uh, the report is signed with a secure verification code that makes possible to recover the original document and the GML files uh, uh, from the website of the cadastre. Uh, in uh, you have below uh, the document collation is uh, how can with, with this CSV you can obtain the, the information. Uh, the report has also the coordinates and boundaries and uh, neighbors of the new parcels uh, because the, the notary or the uh, register need it for uh, the description of the parcel. Um, there are some report examples. The first one is a union between two parcels is, is positive. Uh, below we have a negative uh, report because the form of GML and the parcel does, don't fit uh, very well, as you see in the, in the plot. Uh, some details about the graphical validation report. The cadastral cartography is the ba basis. Geographical reality is an overlay on the cadastral cartography, uh, expressing the twist and displacement if exist. Uh, the rule is the perimeters of the new parcels must correspond with those of the old parcels to keep the continuity on the map. Uh, the 
CSV of the record avoids the physical exchange of files and enables the automatic capture of information. You only exchange this code, not the uh, whole report. Notaries do not need to use GIS. They incorporate the PDF uh, file directly to the deed. And registrars access the graphical content in the XML file automatically. How it works in the register? The Act 13 of uh, uh, 2015 lets the registration of graphical georeference representation of real estate in register. It can be cadastral or alternative provided by the owner. Graphical georeference geo representations get into property rights register by a GML inspired file. Land register takes the UTM coordinates, the unique registered state number and file number to make a GML inspired file signed electronically and the register puts a new secure verification code, code assigned is incorporated to the register in a paper sheet because the register, even today, is a register with books, with uh, um, electronic, but with books. Um, graphical your Sorry, uh, one minute. Okay. Re representation uh, produces the strong effects of registration. Um, this is the web page of the register. You have the, the paper sheet with the book, you have the GIS of the register, you have the coordinates UTM, and you have the geo portal where the register makes publicity. The conclusions are uh, geographical information is reinforces a key part of the e government. GML inspired cadastral parcel has a practical and legal use in Spain. GML file is known by surveyors, engineers, architects, notaries, registered workers. It is becoming a standard in cartography exchange. All the applications, products, and services have been developed and worked together between cadaster and register. There are apps, complements, applets for CAD and GIS developed by private initiative. Most of them are uh, open source. Uh, technology enables solutions that previously they were impossible to think about. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So the floor is open for any questions, uh, comments to the speaker. Yes? Sorry. Uh, could you, the mic, uh, do we have a, a microphone perhaps? Uh, come, come, come here, it's, it's okay. easier. <laughs> uh, I didn't get exactly how the, how the alternative representation was uploaded on the portal. Do they provide GML files? Yes. Oh, uh, I'm really impressed. <laughs> I, I, I thought it was uh, pretty hard to ask So any further questions? So with that, okay, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. And now I invite to the floor our second speaker, uh, Mrs. Marie Lambois from France. The floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so, I am going to talk to you about a very technical subject. Uh, 
Uh, it's about the WFS profile that we uh, defined for the national urban uh, planning website. So I will give you some elements of general context, but in this project I'm really a technician, and uh, this project uh, uh, is made by a lot of partners, and so I might not be able to answer all your, uh, your questions about that, but uh, in the conference uh, there are some uh, specialists about this project, uh, Aline Coupe made a presentation yesterday, so if you have any questions, please ask her. <laughs> so, anyway, some elements so that you understand the, the general things. So, how, how do, why did we set up such a, a portal? So, the idea was to access uh, urbanistic rules uh, more easily, I would say. Until now, if you wanted to solve this, uh, to, to see these plans, you, you had to go to the competent authority head office in each city and uh, open a, a big book and, uh, and, and, and find your, 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 the plan you are looking for. Um, no, there are specific laws about that. So in, in 2020, all the urbanistic rules will be available on a single portal. So like that, well, first of all, to simplify access by citizens to the urbanistic rules and maps when they want to build an extension of their house or whatever. Also to facilitate urbanism stakeholders' jobs because they need to exchange a lot of uh, urbanistic files so they can easily uh, access to others' uh, files. And uh, last but not least, uh, to, imply, uh, to apply the inspired directive, uh, because in this team, in this specific team, a lot of uh, data providers uh, had to make their data uh, inspired compliance. So it was uh, pretty hard to, to ask them uh, to do so. So it's also a way to help and, and be inspired conformant. So, as I said, the cur currently urbanistic data are produced by municipality or city services, often still uh, paper-based. So, the French strategy is to digitalize that. So, it's starting now. Uh, right now, quite few uh, municipalities have, have done the work already, but it started. And then the digitalization must be done in respect with the national standard that we have, uh, which made, was made by the CNIJ, which is the national uh, coordination uh, structure for Inspire in France. And so then they have to publish it in 2020 on, on the national portal uh, by law. So it's our little uh, French uh, Inspire. <laughs> So as I said, the, the CNIJ is the National Council of Geographic Information, which coordinates uh, the thing. Um, the national CNIJ standard specifications are close to inspire data model. So as a technician, I would say that it's more a prayer than a statement. <laughs> it's not that close in reality, but it's uh, mappable. The content is uh, aligned more than uh, the schema. But uh, it's more easy to understand for, from local actor points of view. Um, uh, it takes into account their practice before that, so, so it's, uh, it's more easy for them. Uh, it's updated in line with French law evolutions. And uh, we also provide a validator for these standards and on the CNIJ website. So to upload their data in the portal, the producers uh, have three ways. So the first one is that they produce a zip file. I will talk about it, but the national standard is, is a zip, zip file. So they just upload that on an FTP platform. They can set up an Atom feed, there is an, app, an Atom profile, and a WFS. Uh, with a WFS profile, I'm going to present. 
So that's it for the general things. So, no, no, let's go to the more technical aspects. So first of all, the, the WFS profile is based on Inspire technical guidelines. Uh, two reasons for that. Uh, of course, we wanted to keep the Inspire compliance, but we also didn't want that uh, data providers have a duplication of efforts and, and we couldn't ask them to set up one WFS for the urbanistic geoportal and one for Inspire. So both of them are compliant with, with both portals. Uh, but um, we decided that it was also quite hard to say, oh, by the way, to set up your WFS, you, you have to read first the WFS profile for urbanistic rules, then you have to read the Inspire technical guidelines, then you have to read the OGC WFS uh, standard, and we didn't want to lose them, so it's made quite easy as a cookbook, uh, so that it's the only document they have to read. The first big work was to define a GML encoding. As, an, as I mentioned before, the, the standard was based on shape files and a zip file structure, so it was not that easy to serve that in a WFS. So the first question was how to put that into a GML file. So we split it in several parts. So the first directory is about geodata, so it's a directory of shape, shape files, so that was quite easy. Each shape file became a GML file. So that, that was the easy part. Then there is another directory with a lot of documents, PDF documents mostly, uh, describing the urbanistic rules apply, etc. And so we did decide, we decided to make a zip with, with all these documents and to add an, an element in the GML file called, called the URL PE, uh, which is pointing to this uh, zip file. Of course, the zip file is hosted somewhere on, on a classic uh, file server. The last element of, of the zip standard was the metadata, as the metadata was uh, included in the zip. So to, to be aligned with the standard, we had to also add a new attribute in the GML file to point to this uh, metadata file. Um, then a uh, tricky thing was to know how we could uh, uh, know that an update uh, has been made in the, in the data because um, urbanistic data are quite uh, heavy ones, so it was not an option to harvest the WFS every day. We had to check that it, uh, it had been updated. So. The solution we set up was based on update sequence attribute of the get capabilities. So it's a um, standard or GC attribute. So each time uh, the update sequence is uh, incremented, then it means that something has changed in the data. Then the, the central points uh, only harvest uh, elements based on, uh, on identifier to, to see uh, which one has changed. Uh, then uh, we also added some uh, little precision on the content of the get capabilities document. So uh, one issue was how to uh, make sure that the WFS was uh, compliant with our WFS profile. So the first thing we imagine is to add um, an OWS profile element pointing to the version and title of the profile. But um, in testbed, we realized that this element was uh, not implemented by most softwares. So we kept that as an alternative, but the main option is to include a fixed uh, sentence uh, in, uh, in the abstract. 
we also add uh, specific keywords to make uh, easier the discovery of the service. So that's it. So that's really quite few more elements than what the, we have in the, the technical guidelines of uh, WFS. Uh, you can find the latest version of the WFS profile on, online on the CNIJ uh, website. And if you want to discover the Geoportail de l'Urbanisme, uh, here is the address. I also <laughs> pointed to uh, the map itself as uh, the portal is in French, so it might be difficult for you to find uh, the real <laughs> portal address. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions, comments from the audience. Yes, Michael. Uh, thanks, Marie. Very interesting. Uh, just a quick general question and a more technical one. Um, do you know um, how many people are using the different options that you pro pro proposed in the beginning, the, the sh zip file, the atom feed, and the WFS? Um, no, I don't know exactly, but I, I don't know the number, but it's, uh, it mostly depends on the profile of the, of the authorities. Uh, some are... Um, which regional uh, platforms which are used to set up uh, inspired WFS, so these platforms, uh, for them it's really easy to, to set up such, uh, uh, such things. And for municipalities, it's easier to make a, a zip file, of course. But as I said in the beginning, uh, right now quite few uh, municipalities have done the digitalization yet, so it's hard to, to have a global uh, overview. Okay, thanks. The more technical question was about the, the update uh, or the incremental harvesting. I think that's very interesting, and it's, uh, I think it's an, an issue that we will have in the future for more and more uh, Inspire services as we start to, to use them. So I think that that's an interesting aspect that you, you looked into to, to see how that can be supported. Do you think that that could be, a, your solution could be something that could be applied across the board to, to other applications as well? Oh uh, yes, I guess, because, well, the, the, the definition of the update sequence attribute in, in OGC is not that precise, so the only, um, a problem is, it would be if somebody uses it uh, for something else already. But um, in France, we did not uh, find any other uses. So I guess it could be an option, yeah. Yes, thank you very much. Further questions, comments? Yes? Thank you. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, I have a question. Uh, there is an initiative to provide this information also to the cadaster, for example, or any or, or, uh, uh, to collaborate with other organizations that will use the, uh, the urban data. Uh, yeah. The, the, well, this project is already a project in collaboration between uh, uh, different uh, ministries. So it's uh, it's it's really yeah. The the idea is really to to do something uh, uh, mutualized uh, between the, the different uh, organizations. I guess Cadaster might be one of them. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, further questions, perhaps. Um, I have a question actually. Uh, I checked this uh, uh, page and um, uh, it's really, really um, um, impressive and actually very user friendly as I see and probably very useful for, for uh, urban planning. And uh, I actually have a question probably along the lines what the, 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 the previous uh, um, question uh, um, uh, highlighted. 
Is that how, how uh, are there any, any ideas of uh, further integrating further environmental elements, for instance, uh, air pollution uh, emissions uh, into this uh, site, or, or that is uh, considered completely uh, separate? No, from what I know, it's, it, it's not foreseen yet, but uh, as we based uh, the API on uh, standards uh, API, uh, it, it wouldn't be technically difficult, at least, uh, to, to then uh, uh, view this data together and have, uh, have uh, analyses uh, with them, I guess. It's not foreseen yet. The, 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 the big work is, is right now is to digitalize the data. And then once, once we have these data, we, we will find a lot of application, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, my second question uh, would be, um, how do you, what do you foresee at all any, any uh, further expansion over the border, uh, for instance, in a cr cross frontier uh, uh, context? So, for instance, with neighboring member states, you know, to, to build a common uh, uh, registers or common platform to, to view these da data. Um, no, from what I know, no cross-border application is foreseen yet. Um, it's even non, not really clear yet uh, when and how will be the inspired transformation made. On, on the data, so the, the idea is to make it uh, on the central point, but it's not that defined yet. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> so now our uh, next speaker, Michael Lutz from GRC. Thanks, Adam. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Michael Lutz from the Joint Research Center, and uh, I'm presenting to you a work that's mainly done by my colleague, uh, Andrea Perego, who unfortunately cannot be here today, um, about the GeoDCAD application profile um, for um, sharing and reusing geospatial metadata across borders and across sectors. I have to apologize for my voice, um, my sexy voice today, and I am, uh, <laughs> the conference is taking its toll on me, so I hope you can hear me well. Um, so just to give you a bit of context on why we've been doing this work, um, there's a, a number of activities uh, going on at the European level in the areas of, um, of data sharing, um, public sector information, and open data. Um, of course, we have Inspire that we all know and love, but there's also other, um, there's other activities and regulations. Um, for example, the Public uh, Sector Information Directive that has been revised in, in 2013. Um, we have um, communications and decisions from the Commission uh, about um, open data um, from, from the Commission side and also uh, opening up uh, and the reuse of Commission um, documents. Um, and last but not least, we have a program um, on in the interoperability solutions for European public administrations, uh, ISA, that it has just been renewed into the ISA squared program uh, this year and it will run into 2020, that is developing uh, solutions um, um, for um, interoperability uh, of e-government uh, in Europe. And, and that's been the, the program under which we've been doing this work as well. Um, you may have seen the presentation uh, by the colleagues from uh, Conterra just in the, the last session um, about the European uh, Data Portal, which is, is um, meant to be a single access point for cross-border discovery of, of data sets um, available from EU data portals. Um, that portal will uh, harvest all kinds uh, of, of data sets, including um, a large majority or a large number of geospatial um, data sets um, as well. So the geospatial component is, is a, an important um, aspect of, of this um, data portal at the European level. Um, what's interesting in the portal that it, it has a number of uh, additional services in the user interface. For example, uh, an EU level a gazetteer that allows you to, to search across um, Europe based on, on, place, on, on common place names across Europe. And uh, this is only made possible, um, of course, 
like with Inspire, to based on harmonized and cross domain metadata exchange formats. So what's uh, GeoDecad AP? Um, it's simply a geospatial extension of the DCAT application profile for data portals in Europe. Um, that is uh, the profile that is meant to provide an interchange format for the um, data portals um, in, in the EU member states, and it's also the underlying um, um, profile um, used by the, the data portal that I, the European data portal that I mentioned earlier. Um, DCAT AP is based on a vocabulary, DCAT, um, that is describing all the concepts and the relationships um, that are used in the profile. So that's basically providing the semantics um, of the metadata elements that we have in the, in the profile. Um, the the GeoDCAT AP has been developed, as I said, in the context of the um, European Union ISA program. Um, and the aim was to provide a, a DCAT AP compliant representation for geospatial metadata. And that um, we looked at not all the elements that um, we have in the rich uh, standards that we have, but only a limited number, basically inspire metadata elements and uh, the core profile of ISO 19115 um, from 2003. So these are the elements that we wanted to make sure that the GeoDCAT um, application profile would support. So what's the relationship uh, with Inspire? Um, the idea was that we agree on a common RDF-based uh, representation because um, GeoDCAT IP is, is based on, on RDF, which is increasingly used as a, an alternative representation uh, of Inspire metadata. Um, and we've seen that in, in a number of countries um, there have been um, approaches and there have been initiatives to start um, add, using DCAT uh, AP for their geospatial metadata, but we've seen that everybody did it slightly different, be, differently because there, were, there was not uh, an agreed or standardized, harmonized way to do it. So we, we thought um, that, that it was a, a danger to interoperability, so we, we wanted to intervene at that point and say, okay, look, let's, let's come up with a common way uh, to do this. Um, the other aspect uh, to this is um, to see that we wanted to give uh, an opportunity to member states to share their uh, geospatial metadata across sectors um, into the open data world. And I don't know, some of you may have been to the, the, to the other session uh, earlier today uh, where we've heard a number uh, of talks uh, about this um, bridging the gap between the two worlds of the geospatial world and the more, let's say, mainstream IT um, open data world. So that's basically one of the, the driving forces for us to develop um, uh, this application profile. Um, as I said, Inspire metadata are already and also published on the, harvested and published on the European data portal, um, which uses DCAD AP as the metadata exchange format. So we basically, again, wanted to, to allow that we don't lose the additional elements that we have in the geospatial uh, metadata, um, but we give um, also portals like the European Data Portal the chance to have uh, to understand um, the, these additional elements in their own language. Um, this is an important slide. Uh, we internally we call it the disclaimer slide um, because um, we, we get a lot of questions about about this um, whether. GeoDCAD AP will replace the current technical guidelines for Inspire metadata. Um, and we want to make clear that it's, it's not, that is not the aim. The aim is for us to give owners um, of geospatial metadata the possibility, opportunity to share their geospatial uh, metadata and therefore also make their data more known outside our um, own community and, and make them available in, in a more wider context in, through open data portals. Um, yeah, so that's basically the idea to give an additional opportunity and not to replace the, the, the guidelines and standards that we've developed for our own domain. Uh, the current status of the specification is as follows. We have finalized the, the specification version one in December 2015. It's available on the join up platform uh, of the ISA program. Um, there is also a, a reference implementation based on um, XSLT that basically can 
uh, converge between um, ISO um, metadata and the DCAD IP. And I will say a bit, few more words um, afterwards about that. Um, there's also a number of um, implementations um, available that are listed on the, the join up page li listed here. Um, some of them are also based uh, on a CSW interface. So if you're interested in, in those, you can have a look there. Um, there's two sp uh, specific implementations that I want to highlight here. One is um, what we call the GeoDecad AP API. Um, that is basically a proof of concept for the implementation of the GeoDecad AP that is using this XSLT transformation from um, ISO metadata uh, to, um, to DCAD's GeoDecad AP. And you can, uh, well, again, I will say a few more words about that in a minute. Uh, the other one is something that we've set up at the JRC where we have used um, some of the metadata of the Inspire Geo portal that we are harvesting uh, from the member state endpoint in Inspire. Um, and we've basically, um, again, did done the transformation uh, to GeoDecad AP and put the resulting RDF into um, uh, um, a, an RDF a data base that is accessible through a Sparkle endpoint. So for those of you who are more technically oriented and, and are into RDF and Sparkle, you can use um, that sandbox in order to to play a bit uh, around with um, the maybe additional opportunities that um, the, the, this RDF um, representation gives you um, to interact with the metadata. Uh, this is a screenshot of the uh, GeoDecad AP, AP API, um, where you can actually insert a, a CSW endpoint um, and transform um, basically all the metadata that is contained in that, in that endpoint. So that is something um, for you to, to really, if, if you have a discovery service uh, based on CSW, you can, you can simply use that, um, that um, application to, to convert uh, your metadata to um, GeoDecad IP in a, in a very simple way. Um, the main objective, um, again, of this application would be to, to have a working example on how this can be supported without actually changing the existing infrastructure. You, you don't need new tools, you don't need new um, ways of, of managing your metadata, but you can just put it on top of your CSW. Um, you can also see how you can um, have more traditional HTTP functionalities um, in your CSW, so um, content neg negotiation, for example, if you want to access your, your metadata in different formats in the normal web way, this is another um, way that this would be enabled by this application. Um, this will also help to make your metadata more visible on the web. I think that's again a, a recurring topic that we've heard over the days, uh, the last few days here. How do we make, uh, how we take our geospatial data through the metadata maybe out of our niche and in, bring it into the, the wider web and make it more visible also to search uh, engines like, um, like Google. Um, and uh, if you're not aware of it, I, I'd, I'd like to point you to uh, the GeoNovum testbed uh, on spatial data on the web that have been looking into these uh, topics uh, in, a, in, in quite a lot more detail. And there have been also some, some interesting presentations about the results of that uh, yesterday. Um, so if you've missed those presentations, um, please go on the videos of the, of the conference afterwards and, and have a look if you're interested in that topic. There's a number of open issues with the GeoDecad AP. Um, we are still looking for some standardized vocabularies for things like reference systems, temporal and spatial resolution, and data quality. Um, for many of the other ones, we, well, for all the other elements, we, we basically have found the, the good um, vocabularies to be used. One of the big uh, issues is that there is um, a limited use of global persistent identifiers in the current metadata in the geospatial domain. So it, it is, that makes it difficult to implement incremental harvesting because if you're harvesting maybe also through different routes um, from the local to the national to the European uh, portals, it's difficult to know whether a metadata record that you have harvested is the same as another one if you don't have a persistent unique identifier. Um, also, it's... Um, it's difficult to, to uniquely uh, identify resources um, like organizations, keywords that are um, referring to the same entity. Um, we, we've seen in the Inspire Geo portal that, for example, the same organization is um, in, in its own metadata is referred to in many different ways when you use free text um, fields. 
So that's another thing where, where we could really improve the interoperability by using more standard um, identifiers. Um, there's some ongoing work. Um, even though the working group is formally closed, there's still a, a, a mailing list and the, the, the community is still active in, in discussing some topics. One of them is the alignment of the Inspire spatial data themes, um, some ISO uh, topic categories and data themes from the, um, that is used by the European Union Publication Office. Um, there is a document that lists the, these discussions and the mappings um, uh, in this topic. So that's uh, on the, let's say, the, the topic keyword um, um, side. Um, again, for we're still testing and enhancing the mappings defined in the application profile, um, and this should be the basis for a possible future update um, of the GeoDecad IP if we find things that, that can be improved there. Um, another point uh, that is not uh, closely related only to the geo aspect but to DCAD IP in general is the question on how do we link our data sets to services. Um, again, there are, um, there is, in DCAD there's not really the notion of a service but there is the notion of a, a di what's called a data set distribution. Um, and it's not really clear yet on, on how to model the, the concept of the services that we, we have in Inspire and in the geospatial world. Um, uh, in, into the DCAD IP. Um, but that might be something that will be um, addressed in the, in the future update of the DCAD IP um, base uh, profile. Um, I think this is a very technical issue. Um, we also want to support a better um, uh, content negotiation, not only on the formats, but also on the, the profile. So for example, you don't want to say, give me only give me the metadata in XML, but you want to say, give me the metadata in XML in the ISO 19139 profile, or give me the data in XML in Dublin Core, and so on. So I think that is, again, something that is uh, discussed uh, also in the spatial data on the web working group, um, and there will be um, a workshop in later this year, November, December, I think, um, of the W3C on DCAT that will be addressing these issues as well. So in conclusion, um, we found that the, um, apart from that this, uh, people tell us that this is a very useful activity to, to make the metadata more widely accessible. We, we find that uh, it will be useful to have more uh, globally persistent and uh, resolvable identifiers um, to, um, to do this work and, and, and to better integrate with other data sources and service platforms. Um, we also see that there the, the can be actually a big benefit of, of sharing our data in a more web, webby way in order to make it more uh, easily uh, accessible by applications, by de through developers and, and through mainstream search engine. Um, we have the, the, the open questions around the, the content negotiation and, and the mapping uh, to, uh, between data and services um, as, I, as I described um, earlier. So that's it from me. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions, and some of them I may have to pass on to Andrea, but I, I will do my best to answer them. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much, Michael. So the floor is open uh, for questions. Yes? Yes, hello. Uh, Carsten Bering from the European Food Safety Authority. Uh, for us, um, the INSPIRE directive is not, not binding, but we are interested to in the future, publish our maps, open them, make them discoverable. So is, the, is it for us more, uh, an alternative or bo uh, more interesting to go more in the direction of the Inspire Geo portal or to the EU Open Data portal where we need to put or we want to put any other data, non-spatial anyway, or both? Okay, I, th I think the, 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 there's no black and white answer to that, I, I think. It, um, I think the, the first step, if you don't already have it, is to, to think about uh, how to structure and manage your metadata about your data um, in, in general. I think that's the, the, the first step that you should be thinking about, not so much about what will be the exchange format um, that, that you will use in the end. I think we, we had that uh, discussion also uh, in the, the presentation earlier in the last session. Uh, with Geraldine in the back, uh, did a nice presentation on, on looking at the different aspects and whether to use one uh, alternative or the other. But I think the, the, one of the findings was that it's important to do a, a good and proper management of your, your metadata. 
and then it becomes relatively easy to serve it out in one format or, or in another. So I think uh, that the first question you should ask yourself, what are the things that are important in terms of metadata for your users? Um, uh, and then um, if, if you then put that um, in, into a proper management system, it, it should be relatively straightforward to, to serve both the, um, the, the geo community, if you want, and the open data community as well. Maybe uh, two short questions. Um, if you do the transformation, you will always have a kind of information loss. So what do you think of the information loss if you go from ISO to GeoDCAT? That's a very detailed question. That I'm, I'm not 100% sure I can answer, but um, yeah, I, I, would, I would have to go back to the, to the details of that. I'm, as you say, the, there will probably always be an information loss. Um, but let's put it that way. I think one of the things that we found is that ISO is very um, permissive. So if you look at the ISO specification, it's huge. You have like, I don't know how many, 100 plus elements that you can use in the metadata. Um, but most people only use a, a small subset of that. Um, also gives you a lot of options um, to, to provide um, contact details. Just to take an example, you can say point of contact and then you have like 15 different roles that the point of contact can be. So you're really um, opening all kinds of possibilities. Um, and I think um, the, the DCAD probably is more restrictive um, in that sense, but that may also be a good thing, I think. Um, because if, if you look for just at the point of contact uh, thing, it, it maybe it, it's just enough to have the one contact email of a person that you can call if you have further questions. You don't necessarily need to have all the details on who was the creator, who is the publisher, who is the uh, point of contact, who is the, I don't know, there's like really 15 or so different roles in ISO for that. Um, so I think um, the information loss in some cases may be actually a good thing and may help you to use your uh, ISO um, metadata in a responsible way. <laughs> or in, in a way that, it, that is actually um, useful and, and doesn't open all these, uh, these different opportunities. Okay, thank you. And then the, the second question is, uh, what would be the ideal place to do the transformation? Should we build it on top of our national uh, catalog service? Or if the European data portal does it, why should we do it at the national level? Is that not a better place to have this transformation being done? I mean, I think again, that depends a bit on your national needs as well. Um, um, I think, um, one doesn't exclude the other, I think. Um, uh, I think if you have a need at the national level to, uh, to have a national open data portal, you should do it at the national level. If you don't see a need at your, at your level and you think your only users will be European, um, then it can clearly be done at the, at the European level. I think there's no right and wrong answer. It, it's, it's really uh, depending on, on what your data users' needs are. Sorry, colleagues. We only have sorry. Uh, just um, we only have time for one uh, last uh, question, and then uh, we'll come back okay. to it uh, at I the end. My name is Iri Polacek from the Czech Office. I think this is serving this is mapping and cadaster, and I must say, unfortunately, we have real uh, production experience mm -hmm. with running parallel two uh, uh, metadata services. One for uh, Inspire. Geoportal and parallelly uh, the other emulated DCAT for uh, our national open data uh, portal. Uh, the first thing that we are not very happy with r running it parallel because it brings some trouble certainly. So it would be fine to fix it but uh, the main reason why we could not do this is that while Inspire Geoportal <coughs> Uh, harvests uh, metadata on data series and uh, a large number of items uh, the local or uh, the open da data job or the, uh, harvests uh, metadata on data sets mm -hmm. and just I think 12 items that's uh, that's the that would be fine to fix it 
And the other experience <coughs> is after six months of uh, trying, uh, they will not be able to harvest our metadata. As, as you mentioned, there is no incremental harvesting. And we have now 100,000 uh, open spatial data sets. Mm -hmm. That's all. OK, thanks. I, I think we'll, uh, the, the, uh, we're interested to hearing these implementation experiences. Maybe we can have a, a chat about that in more detail in the coffee break. Also, for the other people who, who wanted to ask questions, I'm, I'm here uh, over lunch. Uh, so please come and talk to me. It, it, it's really interesting always to see that people really love metadata. <laughs> <laughs> or hate. I'm not so sure. <laughs> yes, Thanks. thank you. Thank you once again, Michael. And uh, sorry for colleagues who could not uh, actually formulate now the questions. But either at the end of the session or afterwards, Michael will be, Michael is very flexible <laughs> and available for further discussions. So thank you for your understanding. So I invite to the floor our next speaker uh, from the Netherlands, uh, Mr. Heiko van der Wecht. Okay, good uh, morning everyone. Uh, my name is Heiko van der Vecht. I'm working for the Dutch Cadastre, uh, the Cadastre Land Registry and Mapping Organization. Um, I'm not very fond of uh, metadata at all, so I'm going to talk to you about um, a portal. Well, you would say a portal uh, distributing information, uh, geographic information is not very special, and I agree to that. But I want to show you that it's part of a a bigger plan in the Netherlands, and uh, I also want to talk to you about growing from being a, let's say, a one-way direction, providing information, so like a portal, to a platform where we have interaction and engagement with the others. Um, well, PDOK, or PDOK, meaning roughly public services on a map. What is it? Well, like I said, it's a portal. It's for the distribution of web services, uh, data sets uh, in the Netherlands. It's uh, part of a bigger plan, a bigger e-government initiative, um, making sure that data, whatever data, is uh, made available to society and for everyone to use. Um, in this case, we decided to make author authoritative data uh, available, geo-information data available. It's all about open data, but it comes from official public organizations. Um, it's fully based on inspire requirements, so all the qu quality of services demands, like uh, availability, performance, and uh, capacity, are there. And of course, it conforms to open standards, it's uh, components-based, uh, ready to grow uh, to more usage. But maybe one of the special things, it's, it's, it's a partnership, a partnership of public organizations, and that is something you don't see very often. Um, so who are these public partners? Because they are public organizations. Well, one of them is the Ministry of Infrastructure and Environment. Uh, the other one is the Department of Waterworks, uh, Waterways and Public Works, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, Cadastre. These four are data producers, so they produce a lot of the, uh, data, ge geographic information. And we have another uh, uh, group of people, GeoNovum, already mentioned by, uh, by Michael. Um, it's a sort of executive committee for the spatial data infrastructure in the Netherlands. So they have a very strong advisory role but I will come to this detail later on. So the objectives, well, for the partners, they said, why should we each separately invent the Inspire wheel uh, all by ourselves? So why don't we come together and then make something uh, common, a common facility, and then we can use it all? Uh, and of course, it's about exchange of geodata in work processes, sending back and forth uh, uh, information that's not needed anymore. So there is efficiency is the reason. From a policy side of view, it's more about optimization of your supply of information. It's part of the National Geographic uh, policy. Uh, PDOK is the Inspire Hub 
in the Netherlands. It's also providing all uh, the, let's say, the geographic key registry uh, uh, data sets, like addresses, buildings, uh, topography. And we said we wanted to have a place where open geographic information is available. So this PDOK is the, let's say, the hub also for open data. Of course, if you work together, then governance is key. So we said um, we have an executive board or a steering board, whatever you want to call it. Four partners are there, so the, the producing partners. And Geonovum is responsible for the strategic advice. And Cadaster is one of the partners. Uh, they were chosen to uh, do the, let's say, the technical infrastructure, exploitation, deve development, customer service. So what Geonovum is advising about standards, data models, architecture, and so on to, uh, to Cadaster to make sure that things, well, are state of the art. Um, and there is this National uh, uh, Geographic Information Council, as we call it in the Netherlands. They, let's say, supervise the development of PDOK, uh, how it's developing, in what, what direction, um, like I said, from being a portal to more a platform that is th considered very important. <coughs> of course, there is a customer panel, but more in a, yeah, let's say, traditional way. Uh, we ask them, or they give some information in about their thoughts, but it's not really a uh, uh, collaborating, it's more hearing and listening to their requirements. And from the Geonovum side, they are very much into the international committees and also like, like Inspire and other uh, organizations just to make sure that things are, uh, like I said, state of the art, up to date with all uh, standards. There's also a business model behind it, of course. It needs to be paid. Uh, well, as a user, you don't need to pay anything. So it's the data provider that pays. And for now, we have a four-year contract between the four existing partners. It's about the fixed costs will be paid by the partners. It's about exploitation, development, customer service. So that's the fixed part. But if you want to make available your data sets uh, through web services, whatever, uh, well, then you have to pay. If it's small, whatever small or big is, but then there is a standard price, and if you have let's say nationwide big complex data sets, then, well, the account manager will come and talk about uh, the price you need to pay. So it's a variable pricing. But the good thing is now that from providing information from only the four partners, we are now also providing information from other public organizations. So it's, it's really only public organizations for now. Um, meaning, the, uh, let's say, Ministry of Defense, Chamber of Commerce, uh, the water boards, municipalities, hopefully provinces. So uh, this, this is something that, uh, that is growing. They are not partner, so they cannot, let's say, decide effectively uh, how PDOK will be developed, not yet, but if they become a partner, then they could have a voice. We also agreed on some service level, uh, Service, service levels. Um, we have three levels. We call them government, education, and fair use. Well, government is for the government. Education is for, let's say, the scientific, academic, education uh, uh, part of society. And fair use is for, well, for all other users, be it commercial or non-commercial. If you look at the government uh, level, then they have access to any open data. And if in the future there, are, uh, there is restricted data as well, then they will have uh, access to that as well. They have support and there is no limit. If you look at uh, fair use, they have only access to open data. There is no support for them and the capacity, if needed, in case of emergency situation, it's limited. So this is how we try to uh, distinguish between the, uh, the different levels. Uh, PDOK is also responsible for maintaining the uh, metadata catalog of the Netherlands for the, all the geographic information available in our country. Uh, it's called the National Geo Register. 
and it's also the Inspire metadata portal. Nothing really special about that. It's still, in, uh, it's already there. It's used. Uh, it, it will be developed into a more, let's say, customer-friendly uh, interface. Um, but that was, let's say, how we started as a portal. So having information want, and want to, to make this available to society for, well, whoever wants to use it. So it's about availability of geodata and web services. But it's very supply driven. And it's, it's nothing wrong with that because you have to start with something. And what I want to say is also that it's more for experts like probably you, oh, sorry, uh, you and me. Um, we know how, how to deal with geographic information. But what about the others? Because there's a huge world to, to win in the usage, for instance, of Inspire Data. But a lot of this, these other users are non-specialists, non-experts. These are, let's say, the web specialists, the app developers. They know about geographic information, but they are no real users uh, like we are. So how can we reach to this group of people? Um, uh, one of the things is that you need, for instance, high complexity, because we are familiar with WMS and WFS, but are they as well? Do they know the different kind of formats, uh, like GML? Uh, so there is, th th there is a lot of, well, I could say, difference between their world and our world. So we need to build this bridge of uh, reaching out to the, let's say, to the web uh, people. Um, so we need more engagement with them. So from being a portal, supply driven, to interaction and engagement uh, uh, in a platform. So for me, a platform is about working together. Not that they pay and we do the job. No, that we, you, do, you do the job together. Meaning that they put time, money, effort in it, and we do as well. Um, so it's more of a, as a, 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 a sort of triangle between data provider, uh, the developers, and the end users working together to a, a common solution. Um, so this listening to what the user needs. One of the things that we have developed in uh, PDOK over the years now, of the last uh, year, is the GeoData Store. Of, or you can call it PDOK Lite. It's a free upload uh, functionality. You can call it a sort of YouTube functionality. It's from the government, so the data is from the government, but it's for everyone to use. And it's about just uploading raw data so there's no web service functionality there. Yeah, the input file is the output file, so no transformation, no format conver conversion or whatever. Uh, you have to, when you upload the, the raw data, you have to register it and create metadata in the uh, national uh, geo portal. So people know about this data set. And the geo data store doesn't give any guarantees on performance or uh, availability. So this is one example of how we listen to uh, what the users need, because this raw data is not only something easy for, let's say, a data provider like a municipality who want to provide the data um, easily and, and uh, upload it on PDOK, but also by web, develop, web developers who need raw data. They say, give me the raw data, not the GML or whatever. No, give me the raw data. Sorry, one, one minute. Ooh, that's tough. Okay, well, we also um, developed a data platform, PDOK data platform. It's still in a, um, a better version, but it's a sort of a collaborative environment with data providers, app developers, and users. It's about linked data, creating this. Uh, the cadastral map top, and our top 10 NL is already available. It's about being able to build on the fly APIs. Uh, it's about changing your, your, your format in something that is understandable by the web users. Uh, we're also looking into uh, Inspire data and, and publish them as, uh, Inspire, uh, as linked data. So this data platform is a very collaborative environment, a very nice piece of working together to, 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 to do something together. Other developments, um, it's the idea wall where you can add a wish 
and you can vote on, uh, on this wish uh, messaging uh, service uh, to whenever a new web services or data set are available, uh, when there is maintenance or whatever message is uh, for you as a user is uh, interesting. Uh, top 10 and L will be available in 3D uh, in the end of this year. Um, different versions of the background map. You know, some users say, okay, we don't need a full uh, color version. We also want some gray versions. Distribution of our large scale database, uh, uh, topographic database. Um, and we provide uh, expertise on inspire harmonization to other pu public organizations. Well, at the moment we have almost 100 national data sets, uh, 275 uh, web services, close to 3 billion map requests uh, per year, 450 registered public organizations. The community is growing and it's an, uh, it's, it becomes more an interactive platform. But we also have many unknown users we somehow need to, to grasp. Um, well, in the beginning, this partnership was about partners. Then we, I said, well, you, you need to think in we instead of me, and you have to have a vision, a shared vision and a roadmap, and you need to stick to it. You need to think big, where you want to go to, but you need to start small, uh, separate steps. But another key lesson for me is now that you, you need to know your customers, your users, and there's another world of users than the, the niche we are working in. You need to engage with them, uh, not just at the end, you know, from beginning, from idea to final result. Uh, you need to involve them and probably also need, uh, share the ownership of what you develop. And as that opinion in every step of the whole process. So building your community. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much uh, once again uh, for this excellent uh, example of uh, cutting silos for for uh, ensuring again the attainment of uh, the objectives of the INSPIRE Directive, which is mainly public access and data sharing between public authorities. And this is our very best, one of the very best examples that, uh, that we saw, I think, uh, at this conference. Uh, I would suggest that we, we uh, uh, go directly to the next uh, presentation. And at the end, uh, uh, if uh, the audience is still interested, we can have a uh, final round of questions. Thank you once again. So our next speaker, Mr. Marcin uh, Grutzin um, from Poland. Yes. The floor is yours. <coughs> uh, thank you for the introduction. My name is Marcin Grudzin. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, because it's past uh, 12. And I'm give you a short, I will give you a short presentation about how actions of the organization like ours can supplement, can increase uh, e-government building in the country like Poland. Uh, maybe I will go directly to my presentation. And first of all, I'd like to explain to uh, all, of the, all of you who do, doesn't know who we are. So I'm representing Head Office of Geodesy and Cartography, which is basically Polish National Mapping and Catastral Authority. And we are closely connected to the INSPIRE initiative because we are basically responsible for implementation of INSPIRE in Poland. We, we are also directly responsible for harmonization of data sets for 15 INSPIRE uh, teams. Now I'm going to say a few things that are probably obvious to you, but uh, I decided to put this information uh, here to, for the clarity of my presentation. So I will first start with saying that uh, INSPIRE establishes a framework that consists of some building blocks that are essential for every special data infrastructure to work. And this, these uh, building blocks include, of course, the data sets that are key to the special data infrastructure. Without them, there are no point. No, there is no point of building such infrastructure. There are uh, special data services that are publishing all those data sets. And there, of course, we have metadata that uh, facilitates search of both data set and services. Net next obvious thing that I'm going to say is that uh, these building blocks I mentioned before are standardized, basically in order to minimize workload required to re reuse them by uh, different organizations in different European and 
probably not e e European countries as well. What's nice about the Inspire framework is uh, that it's basically good and it can be also utilized for not only for publication of Inspire data sets and services, but also for publication of national data sets. And we basically, <coughs> in all countries, we are using the same standard to pub publish both Inspire and national data sets, uh, national data sets as well. And we, as an NMCA, are no different. We provide, we have around, around 200 uh, uh, services that are publicly available to, um, to, to our users. And most of those services are utilizing OGC standards, OGC interfaces like WMS, WFS, and so on. However, we have around 50, let's say, other services. And I will focus on one of such services later in my uh, presentation. But uh, what we have noticed that uh, there the, that some users, actually IT developers, has, uh, have problems integrating with our services with those OGC services. And, and this is because of several reason which are, uh, reasons which I would like to point out here. Um, first of all, that significant part of IT specialists uh, specialist who are integrating with our services are not GIS specialists. So they are basically they have basically problem understanding GML structure. They have problems uh, 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 understanding idea behind the coordinate reference system, things like that. For for them it's difficult. So we we have a competition, like a very good competition, uh, mainly commercial or, or open source competition like Google, Google, Microsoft, or OpenStreetMaps. <laughs> Uh, time, so time of the, the developers is expensive, and it is an argument that is related to, to previous ones. So, for example, the, the developers in general work uh, according to the rule that minimum effort, maximum, uh, maximum effect. It means that if there is uh, some service out there or there's some software component that will uh, improve fast and the work of IT developers, the IT developers actually will use it, will use it in order to like uh, facilitate their work. And of course, there are licensing restrictions. So it's a problem for Poland, for example, that uh, users have to pay for, for some of our data sets. Not, not all of the data sets are open. So with, uh, we, we were thinking about this, and we noticed that what we need now as a next step of Inspire of special data uh, infrastructure evolution is the services application with the simple APIs that uh, use some standard but not necessarily spatial OGC interfaces like for example SOAP or REST that uh, have simplified data model. I've heard it many times during this conference that we should focus on simplification of Inspire uh, data models and yes, I agree, we agree with this. Uh, we need services that have uh, that use some sp um, standard popular exchange format like flat XML, like JSON, like K K KML, not necessarily GML. We need some A catching, sim but yet, yet simple map composition, attractive from the point of view of the users. Of course, we have to focus on simplifying licensing and uh, opening our data as well. And we, we created um, in Poland several, in Google, several applications, services that follow uh, the, those principles. One of them, I will only focus on one of them because of the time constraints. One of them is called API. It's basically, its core functionality is to present the user's business objects, lo actually location, or using state official spatial data as a background. So if you know Google API, it's uh, basically our uh, response, the, uh, our uh, answer to Google API. It has some other uh, functionalities uh, available. However, uh, um, maybe it's not the time to mention them uh, here. Uh, I will only add that there is, uh, of course, the online documentation of the uh, API available, and you can look uh, and uh, check the functionalities if you are interested. This is uh, basically a slide showing how the API looks like. It's a screenshot so from our uh, ne uh, from uh, our geoportal. So basically, you can see a map, 
uh, map is, a, is a basically a visualization of our topographic database, but of course there are other visualizations depending what the user needs. And of course in the middle there is a, a dot show, red dot showing the location of, uh, in this case, of our offices. Uh, it's quite interesting how this uh, API has been developed. Uh, it has been, de uh, the answer basically to this question is simple because there was a de demand. But the story was that um, the people from the public sector, from public sector organization came to us and said that they are building some website and then in some, one section of the website they want to put a map. And we said, okay, we have plenty of WMSs, WMTSs, other services, so please use those, integrate uh, with those services, and yeah, it's, it's easy. But they said no, it's, for us it's too difficult. Uh, like I said before, they didn't have the GIS specialist, they couldn't actually uh, easily uh, implement those services, and they basically even said something like this, give, give us something like Google API. And that's why we uh, provided such tool for them. Uh, this tool, like uh, many others that we are provided, uh, that we are providing, has been uh, financed uh, has been financed uh, using European funds. And what's uh, also interesting is that we developed this uh, application to the, to, to, uh, together with our partners within two months from the uh, from the starting our work on it. So re relatively fast. There are several implementation uh, of this API now. One of the first implementation has been done by Ministry of Economy in Poland. So the Ministry was building a, a website that is basically a single contact point to people who are doing business in Poland. So if you are planning or are doing business in Poland, then please, <laughs> uh, you can uh, enter this website and find, uh, find uh, a lot of useful information. However, uh, in this particular case, our API was um, basically used to show the location of over 10,000 10, authorities in Poland who can somehow imp uh, be involved in uh, business processes of inter entrepreneurs. Uh, next uh, example is relatively interesting because um, uh, it, it has been implemented by the General Office of Building Control. So they were working on internet service that would allow users to uh, find documents related to building the development procedures. And at the, some point they noticed that their uh, service would greatly improve, would be greatly improved if they add some special components, add some map uh, components to the to, to the service, and actually they contacted us. We again provided them then API, and now it's a, I think, very good example of how our services can uh, enhance the functionality, enhance the usability of the core business service of one of the Polish uh, of the one of the Polish authorities. And the last example, last but not least, it's something that we call security map. It, uh, it's, a, it's something that has been it's a website. That, uh, that have been uh, developed by us to, to the Polish police. So it's a basically an application that empowers people. So they, uh, it gives the people opportunity to report the location of some minor uh, crime offenses or some uh, pot potentially dangerous sites. So for example, people here can report here, uh, I don't know, illegal waste disposal sites, some car, uh, par uh, car, uh, cars parking in not appropriate locations, uh, people drinking alcohol on, on the public places or, for example, some problems with the uh, road, road surface. Uh, so uh, there are uh, around 20, over 20 categories uh, that, uh, of uh, crimes or dangerous situations that people can report with this application. And what's important, they, uh, all of these reports are verified by the police, po Polish police. They, uh, of course, they are verified. If the verification is positive, then, of course, the appropriate, uh, appropriate actions are taken. And yeah, this is a, st uh, a, slide, a slide showing the statistic of usage of our API. As you can see, this is the sh uh, statistic showing the monthly number of unique users. So as you can see, the, during the last year, the uh, utilization of the service or number of users uh, uh, utilizing the service was growing, but was growing very steadily until the July uh, this year. This is July uh, was the month that we launched this application for the police. 
So it was like huge success. And uh, in July, we actually uh, launched it only for two regions. We have like 16 regions in Poland. And only for two reasons. So uh, I couldn't put the latest uh, statistical information uh, here. But uh, as far as, in, uh, as I, I, I've heard from my colleagues, the statistics are even more impressive now. And what's interesting, during two first months, uh, over 11,000 uh, accidents location has been reported by, 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 by the users. And okay, and let's go straight to the summer. Maybe I will add that this is actually one of the serv services, similar services that we provide in Poland. And let's go to the summer. In the first part of my summary, I would like to answer the question why people use our services for e government. People, uh, IT developers, use our services for e government. And I will have, I put it here several. Both, I think, both statements. I think that we are more predictable. Uh, uh, it means that, for example, people from OpenStreetMap may cease their activities. Sorry, they may cease their, their activities. Google may start charge, charging, for example, for their services. And I'm not saying that it, it will actually happen. Uh, that will happen soon. Uh, but there is always a risk. There is always a chance that it, it will happen. And public sector organization, public sector authorities should take such possibility into uh, consideration. Next thing is that we are part of the public sector. Therefore, other public sector organizations can basically influence our activities. They can definitely influence uh, our activities more than they can, for example, influence activities of Google. We, are, we have at the very top the same boss, who is the prime minister of, of Poland. Uh, we, uh, I think, we have proved we've proved that we listen to our users. So, for example, some standard services uh, require some customization to meet uh, needs of different public organization. And we, like I said, we uh, prove that we listen. We are to some extent uh, uh, flexible. For example, this AP, API uh, service has been uh, updated l twice, twice during the last two years. It was, it was, the updates were answered to the demands coming from other public sector organization. And the last but not least, uh, I, I, I'm, not the, I'm not sure whether this is a good choice of the English words, but I call it reputa reputational factor. It's uh, a rule saying that the pu public sector organization tend to utilize tools, services provided by other public uh, sector organization rather than take something from, a, from like say, commercial uh, uh, sector. And OK, one, uh, one last slide. Uh, it's, it will be like a real summary now. Uh, I, I think that although traditional network services, these OOGC services, provide a lot of information, they are considered by some group, large group of your potential users as difficult and to implement, and uh, as a result, basically not cool. And to, to be uh, just, uh, I will clarify myself. I'm not saying that we should stop providing this WMS, WMTS, WFS services, no. Actually, it's not the, not the case. They, there is st still a big number and a growing number of users of these services, uh, at least in Poland. So uh, still, they are more, uh, more often used as those services that uh, are not, st not OGC standardized. But I think that at the same time, as we are building and providing those OGC services, we should also focus on development of uh, the services, let's say, to the wider, wider audience which are basically simpler, meaning, for example, utilizing standard non-special interfaces, and they are good looking with providing data with uh, well-known well -known, um, data exchange, exchange format and so on. And last but, but not least, I think that maybe it's time to start building such uh, applications or uh, application and services according to the principles I mentioned before. Uh, on, uh, on the European level, on the Inspire level, because always such uh, services uh, created on the European level will be more uh, uh, widely recognized, better perceived by potential stakeholders, by potential, uh, by potential users. And I think that's all from my side. Thank you for your attention.
thank you very much for this uh, insight on the national uh, implementation. Um, so the floor is open. Um, if you would like to ask some questions to the speaker, to the speakers, or you can you can address these um, after the, 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 the session is closed. So um, if uh, if uh, um, there are no more questions, uh, we could we could see in today. Thank you very much uh, once again. Uh, so we could see in today's presentation some uh, national examples. Um, for better data sharing, for uh, 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 ensuring the, the attainment of the objectives of the INSPIRE Directive, and how this interlinks, how this interrelates with, um, with the e-government objectives, which, which are basically almost the same by making uh, more efficient uh, uh, public administration uh, services, digitizing them, making it uh, faster to ensure a higher level of timeliness. And, why, uh, and there is actually a cross-fertilization in this sense, uh, as there are union programs, union funding programs also for INSPIRE, also for e-government. We could see the, the ISA Square program, the ISA pr uh, program. I know that, for instance, uh, the Polish um, uh, system was, was actually funded by, by uh, EU funds, so they received, I think, from cohesion and structural funds, uh, 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 almost 100 million uh, euros and, uh, and, uh, um, during the course of last year. So it's, it's really important to see that, uh, that uh, Inspire Directive in itself will not save the world, in, in my view. And uh, as I actually this was uh, phrased by one of our French colleagues in uh, one of the plenaries. But, um, but this is the, the reason it's really important to channel us and to, to position ourselves in terms of the, uh, the digital single market and uh, the e-government uh, uh, um, action plan. So, um, and this is the good, good thing that we are actually in the forefront because it's, uh, it's actually a uh, younger top priority. His first priority is establishing the digital single market. E-government Inspire is there, so we are actually top priority of the commission. So uh, with that in mind, uh, I would close this session and um, thank you once again for the valuable questions and the, the excellent presentations for the speakers. Thank you.